God bless America. Hello, everybody. I am the Talk Radio Protege. This is the Protege Program. The weekend is upon us. This is the last thing that you need to do before you get to unplug from politics for the weekend. Kick up your heels and relax. So hang on tight. It's going to be an interesting ride. We have a column here, an opinion piece from the New York Times of all places, titled, If We Silence Hate Speech, Will We Silence Resistance? And you you guys tell me, reading through this piece, it seems to me that the author is extremely conflicted. And I'll point out to you why. I'm not going to do a point-by-point point argument against this piece, uh, or pointing, I, I'm just going to go through and make a couple of observations and point some things out for you. In the first paragraph, you'll see where I think I'm justified in saying that the author seems conflicted. Apple, Facebook, well, second paragraph. Apple, Facebook, YouTube, Spotify, and most other major internet distributors took a bold step this week when they all banned content from InfoWars. It's tempting to applaud this move but we should be wary. While Mr. Jones' rhetoric is certainly repugnant, mounting pressure from the political left to censor hateful speech may have unintended consequences, especially for people of color. So the first thing that we can see here is that this author... Let, let's get a name real quick. Let's put a name to these words. Eric Nielsen. Dr. Nielsen has become well-known as an expert in the use of rap music as evidence in criminal trials. That's an interesting one. Uh, an, an interesting expertise to have. But Eric recognizes the danger in censoring things that are allegedly hateful, and, but he's unable to dislodge himself from his identity politics as he talks about the danger of censoring hateful content. Let, let's continue to read. Hate is a dangerously elastic label. I'd like to point out that hate is a purposefully elastic label. As long as you say, we're getting rid of hateful things, there's going to be a big segment of your user base in the case of websites and platforms like the ones previously mentioned, or a big, a, a big segment of your supporters in, the ter in terms of politics. As long as you're talking about dealing with hate... There's going to be a big segment of the population that agrees you're doing the right thing. After all, we've all decided, more or less as a society, that hate is something that is bad. Hate is something that is not to be desired. It is to be rejected. Hate is not a good thing. So when somebody says, don't worry about this thing that we're banning because we're fighting hate, there's a lot of people that are going to say, Okay, fine, whatever. It's hateful. We want it gone, too. That's why, that's why I say that hate is a purposefully elastic label. Not just dangerously, but purposefully as well. And, uh, and what this author does next is something that I, I think is extraordinarily... Um, it, 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 just, it continues to point to me that the author is conflicted. Now... There's a saying, I think it's a saying, in politics that goes something like this. Never give the government a tool or a weapon or power that you would not want to give to your worst enemy. Because if you give that power to the government while your allies are in control, eventually your enemies will be in control and they will use that power against you. For instance... We, let's talk about this censor, censor, excuse me, censorship stuff that is going on. Today, it's the right wing that's being censored. Today, it's Alex Jones that's getting banned off of these platforms. But what if tomorrow the right wing takes control of YouTube and decides that everything that Black Lives Matter has ever said is hateful, and we're going to ban everybody that, it, that sympathizes with Black Lives Matter from YouTube. That would be a bad thing. I will be the first to say that outright banning Black Lives Matter from YouTube and labeling them as hateful would be a bad thing. It would... <clears throat> it, it would... Uh, 
obviously not be good. It would be, uh, it would not be a free, uh, a, a uh, decision made that promotes liberty to ban Black Lives Matter from YouTube. That's why it's dangerous to give YouTube the power to ban people that are allegedly hateful because maybe tomorrow they will decide that someone on the left is hateful and that person will get banned. Now, this author, Mr. Eric here, or Dr. Eric, rather, is seems to me to be conflicted because he's bringing up these examples, but he's going to do something else later on in this piece. Uh, there's the link to this piece. Just search New York Times if we silence hate speech and you'll find this story. And I want you to read it because we're not going to read every single word here in this video. But I want to skip on down. He's talking here about the examples from history of the label of hate being used to attempt to silence people or to target people that, that Dr. Eric believes were unjustly targeted. This paragraph here points to me to some of the confliction it, that's going on in Eric's mind. Hoover is gone, but the tendency to label black radical organizations as hate groups persists, even among groups with more admirable intentions. I find it funny that Eric thinks that the Southern Poverty Law Center is admirable, but nevertheless, let us continue. Which tracks extremists and hate organizations across the country makes the dubious claim that nearly 25% of the 954 hate groups they follow are black nationalist groups. There's no question that black nationalists often argue for racial separation or that many have engaged in bigotry, but it's a false equivalence to label black nationalists and white supremacists alike as hate groups. Now, why, Dr. Eric, why is that a false equivalence? Doing so ignores the centuries of racial terror that gave rise to black, that gave rise to black nationalism as well as the power imbalance that keeps it alive. So... Black people hating white people is justified because in the past, white people hated black people. That is Dr. Eric's... That's the conflict going on in Dr. Eric's mind. It, he's laying it out on paper for us. Now, I don't have the dictionary right in front of me, but if I'm not mistaken, um, hate does not have history involved in its definition. You do not have to have a history with another person to hate them. You are allowed by the definition of hatred, maybe not, maybe it wouldn't be society, socially acceptable, but by the definition of hatred, you're allowed to hate somebody that you have never seen before. You're allowed to hate somebody that you have never met before. You're allowed to hate somebody whom, whose existence you may not even be aware of. So hatred is independent of historical context. So it's not wrong, it's not a false equivalence to say that a white person hating a black person is just as wrong as a black person hating a white person. We might look at a black person hating a white person and say, I get it. But it's not wrong to say that both of these people are wrong in their hatred. It's not a false equivalence. And I think that's all that, that that's painting some of the illustration, some of the uh, conflict that's going on in, in Dr. Eric's mind. Let's keep going. Uh, Another example that he wants to present us is the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. And just briefly here, I want to point out how unfortunate it is. Like, how little forethought did you have to put into the name of your movement such that when you put the acronym together, it's the same as a very taboo sexual practice? Um... Let's see. There, there was, was there. There was some more that I wanted to point out. I don't want to get too, dig too deep into the specifics here, because it's the overall uh, theme of the piece that I want to focus on. Um, let us continue to look here.
I, I may have skipped over something that I wanted to talk about. I wanted to, um, man, it, it just skipped my mind. Uh, let, let's continue to look here. We're, we're right at the end of the column. And I want to look here at this, uh, at these last two lines. That's the inherent danger in attempting to limit something like hate. It can be so broadly defined, in fact it is so broadly defined, that our efforts to counteract it will be broad too. The efforts to counteract something broad must be broad. There is no getting around it. Um, unless you want to take a broad thing and pick something narrow out of it and say, we want to eliminate this, then you're... Uh, then your uh, motivations to eliminate that narrow thing can be narrow in scope. If that happens, if the above happens, we risk silencing the voices and perspectives we can least afford to lose. That's not a triumph over hate. That's falling victim to it. Now, not once in this paragraph, I think, did, uh, did Dr. Eric say that limiting freedom of speech would be a bad thing. He's, he's saying that He's, he, it sounds to me like he is saying trying to limit a bad thing and catching the people that you want to protect in the crossfire is a bad thing. I think that if Dr. Eric had his way, white people would not allow, be allowed to say allegedly hateful things and everyone else would be. That seems to me like the thing that he wants to do. Which is a strange hypocrisy in and of itself. Which is why I think you can see a lot of the conflict that's going on in his mind as he writes this piece. Because he desperately wants for right-wing alleged hatred to be shut down. But he doesn't want any of the selected protected groups to get caught in the crossfire. So a uh, little bit of a nebulous, a, a little bit of a more um, nebulous piece that we've covered here today. But let me know what your thoughts are in the comments down below. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like. If you want to see more like it, hit subscribe and hit the bell for notifications so that you don't miss future videos. Uh, make sure that you check back on Monday for a new report. Until then, have a good night and a great weekend, and God bless.